This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 650, recorded on August 5th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi there, Vincent. Uh, 85 degrees and sunny, headed for 99. Summertime. It's all good. We had a, we had a hurricane here yesterday. Ooh. Um, we had no yeah. power for a few hours. Probably Brienne knows it too. A lot of rain. Did you have for about like high winds and all High that? winds, a lot of rain. Rain was cool. Just so much rain. Uh, you know, a few trees down, power out for a couple of hours. Uh, Con Ed said it was the worst since Sandy, but uh, it's over. Now it's 28. See, ah, it's 28. It's 82 and sunny. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 69, headed to 76 Fahrenheit. That's 21 Celsius with a light breeze from the northwest, four miles per hour. Wow, that sounds cool. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, Vincent already told you that it's 82 uh, Fahrenheit here or 28 Celsius um, and sunny. And yeah, the, the storm here was uh, quite a storm. Um, trees down everywhere. Um, most of this area has power outages. Strangely enough, uh, my power goes out quite easily and it flickered a couple of times and never went out. I have a, if, if you can give me a couple of minutes here, I have a couple of really serious business items. First of all, <laughs> somebody sent me a pair of Tony Fauci tube socks. For those of you who are not looking at the video, it's got a bunch of different uh, images of Tony on them. It doesn't have the famous face palm uh, image, but it's got a bunch of others. And they're really cool. And my daughters claim innocence and my co-hosts claim innocence. So this is a big mystery. Somebody who addressed the envelope as Rich Condit. Okay. So I suspect somebody out there in the TWIV verse. Uh, and you need to fess up because uh, it's really awesome. And everybody em. is jealous Yes. I, I just got them yeah. this morning. I haven't put them on yet. Okay. Gonna, but I will. You're going to be walking on Tony. You? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> Actually, this is really important because on the very bottom of the tube socks, it's black. Okay. It has a surface. Nice. So you don't walk on Tony. Very good. Yes. Please fess up so that we can find out where we can get them for ourselves. <laughs> Okay. So uh, I also uh, want to, because I've been doing this, and I think that this is sort of a, a, a study case, and I'm even going to share my screen here for uh, just a moment, um, update you on the situation here in uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, let me... Uh, and for those who are not, not watching and want to find this, well, the link will be in the show notes, folks. Microbe.tv slash TWIV. What is the website here, Rich Condit? Uh, uh, Austin.maps.arcgis.com uh, slash apps slash uh, <laughs> uh, OPS dashboard or something like that. If you look for, um, you know, the Austin, Texas COVID dashboard, you'll probably get this, something like that. And this is... Uh, uh, as it says, their dashboard. I'm going to show you. Uh, there's a couple of different dashboards, and this is one of them. So this is the seven-day moving average of cases that I've been uh, describing all the time, where uh, we uh, go along at a steady state of about, this is the seven-day moving average of hospitalizations, which I think is a good index of what's happening in Austin. And you go along from uh, the beginning to uh, at about mm, 1st of April, we're running along at about 10 cases until shortly after Memorial Day. And then we get into this big surge that goes up to uh, the first week of uh, July, where we're over 70 cases, uh, 70 admissions per day. And it was a little before that that the governor instituted 
uh, mandatory masking statewide and we shut locally shut down, uh, he actually shut down the bars and cut back on the restaurant occupancy and locally they even shut down the parks. And sure enough, within a little while, it sort of levels off and then has been steadily coming down. But what I want to point out here is that at the very end for the last three or four days, it has leveled off hmm. at about uh, now 30 cases or so. Uh, and I guess I won't go into the rest of it. Uh, but this is consistent with the daily caseload leveling off at about 200 a day rather than the previous uh, like 30 per day or something like that. So in my mind, this is sort of the new equilibrium reflecting the kind of behavior that we're doing now. Restaurants at 50% capacity and um, bars closed, parks closed, face masks everywhere, social distancing, and I don't know what sort of level of compliance we have to most of those things, but it's not going to go down to zero. It's not going to go, I don't think, it's not going to go down to where it was. It's going to level off at a new plateau of somewhere around 30, 35 cases a day, I think. These are deaths, and, right? These are deaths, you said? No, this is hospital admissions. Okay. Okay. Um, which, you know, I think is the a good indicator of uh, caseload. And these are presumably because certain individuals are not observing face masking, physical distancing, et cetera. I presume so. Uh, and I also presume that when they open the schools, we're going to see another surge. Oh, yeah. Let me see. Stop my sharing here. So, mm -hmm. um, and in fact, they're reconsidering the schools. The uh, Austin Independent School District was going to start off at uh, three days oh, or three weeks of uh, virtual classes. Now they're talking about pushing back the opening to uh, around Labor Day, rather like by so that's two weeks from what it was going to be. Uh, and also making it eight weeks. My guess is we'll be virtual all semester at least. You know, at least. We'll I mean, if uh, you if these rapid daily one buck tests come online sometime in the fall, that could change things for the could spring. But oh, speaking of which, did you see the uh, article in the Washington Post about six governors of six states in cahoots to institute rapid testing in those six states? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've got the Rockefeller Foundation helping them out. Good. Okay. So they're getting the message. Yeah. Well, we've uh, got and they, uh, a ton of email from people in various states uh, indicating similar things that, uh, you know, we're, we can't read them all, but states are starting to get on board with this. So it's all good. Great. And Rich, um, we actually just announced today that we're switching to fully virtual. Um, so I, I think that that's probably a, a good call. Um, yeah. and, um, hopefully you will be making that switch your school. Will Brianne, that does that mean students are not coming onto campus? Um, there are some students who are coming onto campus. Um, they are able to, uh, request, uh, to come onto campus either if they are working on a research or some other kind of project that mm. requires being on campus, um, or there's another, a whole other sort of list of criteria of reasons why they can apply Got to come to it. campus. Yeah, both UT. I don't really understand. I don't know exactly the regulations at UT, but my understanding is there's going to be face to face classes, and I know that's the case at uh, Texas State, where uh, my daughter is. They there's a virtual option, uh, but there's also the option for uh, face to face classes as well. So we'll see how that goes. And there was a hilarious little bit in the local paper uh, announcing that um, the uh, UT students were forbidden to party on campus it's like telling them to party Good luck with that <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe it's better if you say go ahead and party and they won't <laughs> i i think the the what's emerging is that if you cannot test frequently and you shouldn't open and uh it's going to be at least for the fall until we get these rapid tests online i do think they can be done uh, and so I've just seen in the past week a school opening somewhere, one case in the first day, and that's it. They shut back down again. So it's going to happen wherever, especially in places where there are a lot of infections. If there are places where there are very few and you're isolated, rural, and so forth, it may be okay. 
but you know, m multiple daily tests would be ideal. Certainly not one every twelve days, as we'll see. No, no. You know, anything and, and, anything less than about twice a week really doesn't accomplish much. No. And and the results need to come back right away. Yeah. Um, we can't have big long delays for those results. All right, uh, Kathy's got an announcement. Okay, so the American Society for Virology Communications Committee set up something last spring uh, when everybody kind of went home suddenly and was teaching online. And it sounds like it's going to be relevant again. It's a resource for teachers, homeschool parents, etc. basically any kind of educational organization who might like to have a virologist come to their virtual classroom or virtual meeting. These virologists have uh, volunteered and they're on a curated list. So there's uh, a link to it on the ASV website. So you just go to asv.org and uh, scroll down a little bit to the latest from ASV and you'll see chat with a virologist and the instructions are there as to what you need to do next. And I suspect that uh, virologists would be happy to talk about SARS-CoV-2, but also about other things in virology. And you can always make the virologist happy by asking them to spend a little time telling about what they do, uh, which is oftentimes going to not be SARS-CoV-2. So that's a hint. So All right. check that out, asv.org. Okay. I'm not on that list, but uh, people know where to find me. And I, I, yesterday I spent an hour with uh, some students in Brazil. It was a lot of fun. Cool. All right. So we have a couple of uh, papers for you before we um, get into some email. And the first, continuing this arc of do children transmit, which I think it's becoming more and more clear that they do. However, this came out actually last Friday around – when we were talking about it on Friday and it didn't have time to get it in, but it's a morbidity and mortality weekly report release for July 31st. It's called SARS-CoV-2 Transmission and Infection Among Attendees of an Overnight Camp in Georgia, June 2020. And really, honestly, I'm, I'm doing this for Kathy because she has fond memories of Georgia. Yeah, but never an overnight camp. <laughs> <laughs> an overnight camp. This would not give you fond memories. No, it wouldn't. Boy, this would be bad. Anyway, this the first author here is, um, I'm looking to see, shared author. The first author is Christine Sibeluski, and the last author is Rebecca Stewart. I would pronounce that Zabluski. Zabluski? Okay. Yeah, you got to live in Buffalo for 12 years to be able to uh, do this. Oh, a lot of Polish people in Buffalo? You bet. Ah, I didn't know that. Cool. It was a great restaurant that was in an old house that uh, was run. It was a Polish restaurant. You go in and you study the menu for a little while, and then she comes in and she takes your menus and she tells you what you're going to have for dinner. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> love it. So the I love the first sentence. This brings back memories. Limited data are available uh, about transmission of SARS-CoV-2 among youths. <laughs> youths. It reminds me of my cousin Vinny. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Remember the guy Utes. Vinny yes. saying to the Ute in the judge, what? what? What is that? You're so Ed Gwynn. It was Ute. great. He was so good. All right. During June 17th or 20th, is an overnight camp in Georgia, and they simply call it Camp A <laughs> for HIPAA rules. For obvious reasons. Um, they had orientation for 138 trainees, 120 staff members, and then the camp began uh, June 21st, 27th. These staff members remained, and then 363 campers and three senior staff members came on the 21st. And they say that the camp adhered to Georgia's executive order, which allowed overnight camps beginning on May 31st. They required all trainees, staff members, and campers to provide documentation of a negative SARS-CoV-2 test less than or equal to 12 days before arriving. And I, I just want to point out that that's it's too infrequent because in those twelve days, right, it could be infected. You could get sick ten times. <laughs> <laughs> you've heard you've heard Daniel Griffin complain about how long it takes to get these these tests. Ten days is too much, you know. So that's part of the the problem here, most likely. And so they say this camp adopted most 
<laughs> of these suggestions made by the CDC to minimize risk. Measures not implemented. The campers did not have to wear masks. All right. Not imp- I'm sorry, they should have worn masks, but they didn't. The camp, the camp said you don't have to wear masks, but the staff members had to, but the campers didn't, which seems to me uh, inconsistent at best. I want to use other words, but I'm trying to be highly professional. <laughs> <laughs> and they also um, did not open the windows and doors for increased ventilation in buildings. Okay. So the, the, the other point you have to know is that the camp attendees, they, they stayed in cabins. Uh, and, and there were quite a few people in each cabin. Plus, they engaged 26. in- 26. 26 This is the per best cabin. part. <laughs> this is the best sentence. Uh, they engaged in a variety of indoor and activity, uh, outdoor activities, including daily vigorous singing and cheering. <laughs> it's true. I remember bringing my kids to camp. First thing they would do when they got there is sing. They all sit on a bench, multiple rows, singing, you know, whatever. So and we know that that's a good way to spread respiratory infections. All right, on June 23rd, one step. Remember, these are all um, young kids, okay? Um, we'll, we'll see the, the ages in a bit, but one teenage staff member left the camp uh, after developing chills the previous evening, was tested and found to be positive for SARS-CoV-2 on June 24th, and then they began sending everybody home, and on the 27th, they closed the camp, and that's when this investigation leading to this began, and I presume that this he- this is in Georgia, which is where CDC is, so that was a convenient thing to do. Uh, so the so the the w- warm up to this was from the seventeenth through the twentieth, and the <clears throat> camp was scheduled for the twenty first to the twenty seventh. So the campers arrived on the twenty first. Mm-hmm. Three days later, this two days later, this person gets sick, and a day after that goes home. And three days after that, they closed the camp. So we're talking about a, a week with everybody there or even less, right? 21st through the 24th, three days. Yeah. Right. Now just this, three days Now this right. with all the kids there. So this individual was negative 12 days previously, but presumably could have been infected after that test, right? Yeah. That's mm-hmm. what, one month. Could have arrived at the camp. Could, could have arrived initially on even the 17th infected. Don't know. Right. So- so a lot of them could have arrived already sick, and then others got sick there. Yeah, and, and, we, and uh, go they ahead. they mentioned that in there uh, at the end. They sort of pointed out as a good caveat. So the uh, this is of course morbidity and mortality weekly report, which is free for everyone to look at. Um, so um, you can read some of the details. But one of the numbers they're going to report here is the attack rate, and this is calculated by dividing. The number of people, so these individuals were subsequently tested, of course, uh, and the number of positive test individuals divided by the total number of camp attendees from Georgia, okay? That's the attack rate, total positive over the total people uh, attending the camp. And the total people were 597 Georgia residents. The median age was 12 years, the range 6 to 19 years. Uh, the staff member medium age was median age was 17 years, range of 14 to 59 years, and they got test results for 344 of the attendees, which is 58 percent. And among those, 260, 76 percent were positive. Oh my gosh! Four days, as you said, Rich. Yeah. Overall attack course, rate: 44 percent. Uh, Go ahead. So uh, a couple of things. First of all. Not everyone was tested. No. So of those tested, uh, the it was 76% positive. The attack rate is 44%, but it could be higher. Yes. Because there correct. were a bunch of people who weren't tested. Yes. I mean, uh, among the people who were tested, uh, I maybe that's a, a an attack rate with an asterisk was 76%. Could be. Um, yep. And uh, maybe we already said this, but. You know that one person was sent home. We don't know. I, I, there got to be other people showed up at camp sick. I, I assume so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't know. you know, this the attendees were not wearing masks, right? I mean, right. they weren't required to. I don't know how many were. Maybe some of them, their parents said you have to wear masks. I don't know. 
and, and you know damn well that 260 of them didn't show up at camp sick no 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 right no. No. so in terms and of age go ahead, go ahead. Okay, that's just what i was going to say in the age group from six to ten years old 51 percent so 51 out of a hundred six to ten year olds uh had the attack rate of uh, so we're virus positive yeah and 44 percent 11 to 17 and then 33 percent 18 to 21 and the attack rates increased with increasing length of time spent at camp with staff members having the highest, highest attack rate of 56%, which would indicate that that's where most of these uh, infections were acquired, right? Which is important. Now, the, the other thing that's quite interesting, of the 136 cases where they had symptom data available, not everyone reported that, 36 patients, 26% had no symptoms. There, so... A lot of asymptomatic infections. They're infected, right? They're positive, but they have no symptoms. And that's that's the report. And uh, obviously, as they say uh, later, some cases might have resulted from transmission before and some after camp attendance. Their conclusion is that SARS-CoV-2 spreads efficiently in a youth-centric overnight setting, resulting in high attack rates among people in all age groups. And asymptomatic infection was common and potentially contributed to undetected transmission. The multiple measures adopted by the camp were not sufficient to prevent an outbreak in the context of substantial community transmission. Relatively large cohorts sleeping in the same cabin and engaging in regular singing and cheering likely contributed to transmission. <laughs> Physical distancing and consistent and correct use of masks should be emphasized as important strategies. I would actually like to hear a report where these things were done properly and we didn't have an outbreak, right? The hairdresser's story of a few weeks ago is an example of that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Two hair, two infections. Really, really small numbers, but still yeah. uh, uh, an interesting anecdote. But you know, you don't hear the negative stories, right? So, unfortunately. Yeah, right. All right. So, that is a good story there. I like that very much. It, uh, the not hearing the negative stories reminds me about how you don't hear about people not getting polio or not getting measles. Yeah, indeed. You know, when they have the vaccine, they don't get those things, and you don't hear about that. Yeah. So. And I want to I want to emphasize that, you know, there's uh, the naysayers out there are probably going to be saying, well, you know, none of these people died. There weren't, they, you know, were no severe infections. They're all, they're all young, okay. And this just, I find so annoying, okay, because all these kids are going to go home to their parents. They're going to potentially go home to their grandparents, okay. This is spreading infection through the community. Mm-hmm. They're, they're vectors. How do, yeah, I mean, we don't know if they didn't spread it to other people and other people that died. We, it's not part of the study, right? Right. Right. So. Right. I mean, and we don't know sort of what happened to them after June, um, if they had any sort of serious complications. Correct. Okay, moving on to our next paper. I picked, even though we have discussed a paper that's really quite similar, although a different approach. I, I like this, some nice classic virology here. Adaptation is published in Science, Adaptation of SARS-CoV-2 in Balbsy Mice for Testing Vaccine Efficacy. And it's from a, a large group uh, out of China, including one, two, three, four, five, six co-first authors. Uh, Gu, Chen, Yang, He, Fan, and Dong. And then the last author has deceased, unfortunately, Yu Sun Zhao. And the corresponding author is Shang Feng Xin. And... I want to complain just for a second because I don't know what science does with its PDFs, and I don't know if you guys had this same issue. You know, usually I download a PDF and I can highlight it with a highlighter. I couldn't do it with this one. It wouldn't let me highlight it. Mm. I mean, I had to open it in Acrobat and do it, and then I, you know, I did that on my laptop this morning, and I couldn't save it. So now I have to look at my bloody laptop because I can't see it on my main screen. So this is annoying. I know it's a first world annoyment, <laughs> but it's none. Why should a, should a PDF should be a PDF? Don't make it something weird that people can't highlight. I do you have any issues about that? What? No, I I printed the copy, but 
Um, sometimes, yeah, it depends if you're doing it in preview or Acrobat in the first place. And So I usually yeah. use preview, and, and most uh, yeah. PDFs are fine. And I'd open this in preview, and I could not highlight it. Nothing showed up on screen. So I opened it in Acrobat, where it took me eight minutes to figure out how to highlight it because it's so oh, bloody yeah. complicated. Uh, and so I could sometimes highlight I get an, it, and then I couldn't save it. <laughs> this document. Yeah, sometimes I get an error message that there's a special kind of PDF um, that is mm. trying to prevent modifications. Oh, for God's sake. Come on, people. Get out of your bubble. You got to <laughs> communicate. All right, so um, I like this because the bottom line is here, they – I want to make a mouse model for SARS-CoV-2. Um, mice are not efficiently infected because the virus doesn't bind well to ACE2 in mice, in wild-type mice. Uh, and there are, of course, ACE2 transgenics. That means human ACE2 gene uh, into mice, um, which were made after SARS-1, as Stanley Perlman told us. And they can be infected for sure, but they get a disease that doesn't bear a lot of similarity to hum human disease. They die of neurological complications mainly. So uh, remember the paper we did, the preprint from Ralph Barrick's lab, where they modeled the interac interaction of spike with ACE2, and they said, oh, if we change these two residues, we could get the, the SARS-CoV-2 to bind mouse ACE2, and that worked, and they were able to infect the mice. In this paper, they take a different approach, in which I uh, designate as classic like classic rock, right? They passage the virus from mouse to mouse and select for a virus that can propagate in mice. And then they find a single amino acid change that does it, which is in the spike in the receptor binding domain right next to one of the changes that Barrick's group introduced. And that's the bottom line here. So you get to the same endpoint in two different ways, one by computer modeling, here by passage, uh, which I think is nice, right? So they start. They take a human isolate and they do intranasal serial passaging. Let me tell you what that is. It has nothing to do with breakfast. Serial passaging, you infect a mouse, uh, in, in this case intranasally, and then they wait three days and they take out the lungs and they homogenize them and then they, they, they take whatever virus is there and inoculate a new, a new mouse with it and they keep doing that until they get something that grows really well. So they start with, you know, 720,000 PFU of virus, collect the lung tissues three days post-infection. Um, uh, and they measure the RNA load and they see that it's reproducing. Um, and then they do this six passages and they have a final stock which they titrate by plaque assay and they use that for further experiments. Um, and they show it, it has enhanced infectivity in mice. It, the, the virus reproduces in the lungs and tracheas at mice. In mice, um, it can also find viral RNA in heart, liver, sp spleen, brain, and feces. Viral RNA. They didn't look for infectious virus, and they showed by immunostaining where, where the virus is reproducing in the lung. They show that there is basically a mild to moderate pneumonia uh, in these animals. Uh, very nicely characterized, if, but I, I don't want to go into it because uh, it's very much like the, the Barrick model. Then they, then they take this virus and they sequence the entire genome and they, five, they find five mutations, all right, which they, they call five nucleotide mutations, but you don't need to say nucleotide because a mutation is of a nucleotide, folks, uh, within the ORF1AB gene, which is the precursor to the polymerase the spike gene and the nucleocapsid gene. Right, and the um, one in the spike is is at position five hundred one, disparaging to tyrosine, and they say this must be it, and that's right next to one of the amino acids that the Barrick group changed. Uh, so they introduce that in. Um, actually, they don't, do they? Do they? No, no they, they don't. don't. They don't introduce it in, but they say. They kind of wave their hands and they say that the, the starting material had the wild type sequence and the final had this one. So this is probably it. So there's a couple of things about the genetics here that I noticed. First of all, maybe you already said this, but of the five mutations, one of them is a synonymous mutation. So mm. uh, oh, is unlikely to contribute to the differences, though it could. Uh, and the other are the others actually encode amino acid uh, differences. 
they don't do any experiments to try and segregate out the individual mutations yeah. to figure out uh, which one confers uh, the difference in properties. And uh, they don't, and this as uh, this sort of pushes my geneticist buttons. They never plaque purify this virus. Where, where are those with. buttons on you, by the way? Where are those buttons? Located? They're all over. <laughs> 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 it's real easy to find those buttons. Uh, they never actually plaque purify this thing. They got this one graph that shows uh, the what they call the base percent of site at 23063, uh, which is mm -hmm. basically the fraction of genomes at every passage that contain uh, this mutation. Uh, and it's up well over 95, it's like 97 or 98% by the time uh, they're out at passage uh, six. But uh, for the life of me, I cannot understand why you wouldn't plaque purify that virus and uh, probably, I guess, sequence it again and grow it up. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, but, you know, maybe it's a, maybe they're in a, uh, I'm sorry. You can't be in that much of a hurry. You got to plaque purify it. No, I agree that this. I have a genetics. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, I you have, have a, a genetics button too. too. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's going to, it's going to resonate with Vincent because in the discussion, they talk about the fact that, uh, they haven't looked at whether the other three mutations regulate viral infectivity. That remains to be determined. And they say, further investigation with reverse genetics will clarify this issue. Okay, so this to me is the exact reason why reverse genetics drives me crazy. Because here they're talking about, let's make a virus that has just one of these mutations, as Rich was just saying, isolate the mutations individually to see what phenotypes they have. But virologists have also used the term reverse genetics to talk about when they've made an infectious clone of their virus, which they can then uh, manipulate, perhaps mutated or not. And so, you know, to geneticists, reverse genetics means one thing to, I want to almost exclusively say RNA virologists, <laughs> um, reverse genetics often means making an infectious clone and, and all they had to do here was say, we need to do the genetics to determine uh, which what the phenotypes of the other indivi right. mutations individually might be. This is a good example of how, because this is SARS-CoV-2, we're in a pandemic, this paper comes through in science without a key experiment, really, uh, showing that yeah. this, because if you, for any other virus at any other time, the reviewers would say you need to do this experiment, but here it could very well be one of these other mutations or they could all contribute. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, actually I should, for the, uh, lay folks out there, uh, just elaborate for a moment on this plaque purification thing. Uh, what this means is that when you do this serial passage, uh, you know, in the, in the first few passages, maybe, uh, you select out a few viruses in the population that are changed, uh, uh, that have a different genotype that have some of these mutations. And then uh, as you passage, those are selected out to the point where at the end you have most of the viruses having the genotype of the sequence that they, uh, that they get here. But it's still a mixed population. It's not pure. Uh, when you do a plaque assay, you dilute out the virus and plate it out on cells and you get individual centers of infection that result from infection with a single uh, virus particle. And you can then go in and actually uh, uh, retrieve virus out of an individual plaque, and you know that that is genetically pure. Mm -hmm. And if you're really um, anal, you serially plaque purify. Do that a few times to make absolutely sure. And then you sequence that again and show that 100% of all of these sites uh, are uh, the, the change, or maybe they aren't. I don't know. But at any rate, yeah. uh, I think you really need to do the experiments with a purified population of viruses. Yeah, a lot of these things that we used to do, tri we used to do triple plaque purification, uh, are, are shrugged off by modern virologists as not being necessary, but they are. They absolutely are, but they're rarely done. We we even recently, fairly recently, last four or five years, made a virus where what we were 
transfecting into cells was just the DNA with the mutation in it. And I plaque purified it three times. Yeah. So I was like, <laughs> Why did you do that? And I said, um, uh, oh, yeah, but because that's the way I was. Does you do it the way you do uh, it? Yeah. I can't help myself. Right. You know? there, are, there are good reasons to do it. There are good reasons to do it because you may have two different viruses emerging from that transfection. They may coincide and make one plaque, and you, right. you just right. need to rule that out. But some people would say, oh, we just sequenced the whole genome. It's fine. You know. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Sorry. One, one thing that I do like about this study, um, though all of these genetics points are very good points, um, they do use and young mice here. Hmm. Um, they do their passage in old mice, and they look at the uh, infection and pneumonia in both old and young mice. The old mice have a little bit worse um, disease than the young mice, um, and I thought that that was a, that's something I don't always see, um, and I was appreciating that. Yeah, but notice none of the mice die. It's not really, a, even in the old mice, it's not very serious. And it was the same outcome in the Barrick study. The older mice get a little more serious pneumonitis, but it's really not the human disease at all. The, the mice actually don't even have any signs, right? They've got to they've got to kill them and look at their lungs to figure out that they were sick. If I yeah, understood what kind this of, what right, would you they think? don't lose weight. They don't lose weight. They're not lethargic. Right. They're not. Uh, they didn't. They didn't take them to the opera. It, <laughs> they, <laughs> yes. Uh, they need to. Uh, I like the hamster experiment. Right. It's too bad mice don't like to run in wheels. But I think the hamster That's experiment fabulous. to measure how uh, uh, how much they use their wheels is just great. Another way you can do that with mice is you can put a camera. Uh, in mm -hmm. the cage and, you know, measure the movement. And, you know, you mm -hmm. can see an impact mm -hmm. on the movement uh, with a virus infection, you know, especially for viruses that cause paralysis, of course. But if you made it hard for the mice to breeze, it would impact how much distance they, they would travel and so forth. There's one other thing. They do a challenge experiment, a vaccine test. They make a recombinant spike and they immunize mice, these mice, uh, mice with this, this variant. <clears throat> challenge with this variant, sorry. And, you know, they're protected from intranasal challenge. But the point I want to make is that they write, the, in contrast, a significant reduction in viral RNA loads, approximately 1,000-fold were seen in the lungs of immunized mice com compared with control. And so I just want to point out, you can't say significant unless you're going to give us statistical numbers, all right? People like to say this, it was significant, but you should just say the in contrast, a reduction or a thousand-fold reduction in viral RNA loads was seen. That's all you need to say. Significant is your personal interpretation without a, a significance number, without a p-value or some such thing. You cannot say. I've, I was taught not to say that because you're interjecting your opinion about what's significant or not, right? Just a little thing there. So uh, to the editors of science, please be rigorous. This didn't have to be published really quickly because there are uh, models out there and people get to know about this anyway. You just wanted to publish it to get a bang, okay? And I would rather you did had them do the right experiments and write it c correctly because the experiment that we're talking about is not very hard to do, right? But nevertheless, an, I think it's cool application of classic yes. virology. There's another experiment I would like to see, and that is, uh, is the uh, virus transmissible in these mice from mouse to mouse? Because do people terms, usually do that with the, these viruses in mice? I don't know. I don't, I don't think. I don't think. Uh, well, mice don't cough or, or sneeze or anything. Then, but it would have to be just breathing, right? So we know yeah. that hamsters do that. They transmit well from their breath because I think they have the turbinates that make it likely that they're going to be expelling virus, right? Whereas mice don't. But yeah, the Barrick paper didn't do that either. I think for transmission, so you need. You know, hamsters, ferrets, non-human primates. So I, I want to have us talk just a little bit about the fact that they did this serial passage in mice and they ended up with a virus that was more virulent, suggesting that these mutations led to increased virulence. So how do you square that with the idea that the virus in people, although it's accumulating or not, not necessarily accumulating, but there are uh, sequence variants that are arising, and we don't think that those are leading to increased virulence. Uh, I don't think you can say this particular mutation is doing anything to virulence. It's allowing the virus to get into cells. <clears throat> so if you can't get yeah, in, uh, how can it? Yeah, in my mind, 
I agree. In my mind, I make a distinction between uh, it's, if you want to say, infectiousness or something like that, and and virulence. Now, um, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily draw a conclusion about virulence from this. Okay, I I see now that I that they're a little bit circumspect in the abstract. They say. Uh, adaptive mutations potentially associated with the increased virulence because, you know, you now have a virus that can, that's adapted and can grow in mice and you had one before at the start that could not. Yeah. So, so. right. Yeah. Okay. Finally, we have a, a paper on some immunology and um, I'm glad Brianne is here. Otherwise we would make mistakes and we'd have to correct them. I, I don't know if we can say that we're not going to make any mistakes. <laughs> no, you can, you can, you can make the mistakes. Okay. <laughs> and then because you're an immunologist, because uh, I'll tell you what will happen. Some people will write and say, you, you guys need an immunologist on the show if you're not here. I've had that happen before. And I say, well, Brianne can't be here all the time. Okay. So cut us <laughs> some slack. But you're here. So yes, you, you can make mistakes as well, but oh, okay. different ones from we would make. I guess. Anyway, this is this is a pre-proof in immunity. Acute SARS-CoV-2 infection impairs dendritic cell and T cell responses. Um, this is from uh, again a group, multiple groups out of um, looks like Hong Kong, right? Yes. Um, and um, let, me, let me get the authors made equal contributions. Number nine. So one. Two, three, four, five co first authors Zhao, To, Wang, Yu, and Zhao. And the last author is Shi Wei Zhen. Shen. Brian, did you like this paper? Um, I did like this paper, although I had trouble getting one of the supplemental figures, and I really wanted to know about the data in that supplemental figure. <laughs> uh, there you go. You should be able to. Uh, you see, this is the problem with supplemental figures. You should be able to evaluate a paper with whatever is in the main paper. But, uh, yeah, we can't always. So these are patients that they studied, right? Uh, mm -hmm. These are a set of patients um, <clears throat> where they pulled out peripheral blood mononuclear cells and, and uh, did flow cytometry to, to look at um, uh, various dendritic cells and T cells and so forth to see if anything was awry so to speak. You know, people have done a lot of antibody studies, but this one is pretty important. So 17 acute and 24 convalescent patients, right? Yes. I had, I had trouble <laughs> <clears throat> figuring out what the definition was of a convalescent patient. And when I dug into the <clears throat> methods, it looks like people who are like on the order of three weeks or greater out from their initial symptoms. Okay. So but they didn't die. <laughs> I would have liked to see some sort of a, a breakdown of the individual patients, yeah. uh, in particular, the convalescent patients saying when it was they did these assays on the relative to uh, either the peak of symptoms or the peak RNA load or something like that, because it's hard to tease out of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a little bit of information about severity. Um, in some of the patients, they talk about mild versus severe. Um, and in fact, um, with their severe patients, eight out of eight met their qualifications for being severe. Um, so that's good. Um, and had oxygen supplementation, but they didn't really um, do any of those other things that you mentioned, Rich. I think that uh, convalescents, certainly, we're not talking about six months. Right. We're talking probably in the range of one to two months. My guess is not even two months. Okay. But it's hard to, it was hard for me, at least, to get that information out of the paper. Mm. All right. Uh, so, they, they take uh, blood, uh, PBMCs, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, do flow cytometry and look for different cell types. So first, first observation, reduced frequencies of um, T cells, NK cells, dendritic cells, and, and monocytes in the acute patients compared with the healthy donors. So healthy donors are, are bloods that they have from, from healthy donors, right? 
Yep. And the other thing that's noteworthy is they did look at B cells, um, but the B cells were not significantly different. So we've been talking a lot about antibodies and antibody longevity. B cells are the cells that make antibody. Um, yet here, the B cell numbers didn't seem to be different. Now, Brian, I have a question. They say the frequency of monocytic myeloid derived suppressive cells was significantly mm -hmm. higher in AP. There's that significant word again without any numbers higher in AP acute patients than in healthy donors. So what is a suppressive cell? Is that like the, the T suppressors or is it something else? Um, so these are myeloid derived suppressor cells. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not going to be T cells. They actually can be uh, one of a number of different types of cells. Um, and um, so they can include things like um, some NK cells, some dendritic cells, and some macrophages. Um, they inhibit the function of other lymphocytes. Um, mm -hmm. And some of that has to do with things like their me uh, metabolic processes and uh, reactive oxygen mm -hmm. species and things like that. So the, the outcome is that by reducing those, you could, that could in part explain the, uh, you know, immune dysregulation that we're seeing. Exactly. And um, I will admit that the uh, supplemental figure that I was having trouble getting <laughs> was the one that told me which markers they had used nice. um, to define these things. And so I can't give you better information about exactly what they are defining as a myeloid derived suppressor cell um, because I was having trouble finding that information. Okay. All right, so they conclude that infection results in broad immune cell reduction during the early phase of infection. Um, frequencies of the, while many convalescent patients had increased frequencies of lymphocytes like N and, and T and NK cells, the frequencies of DC and mononites remained lower than those in um, healthy donors. I have to admit, I have problems with HD and AP and you know, healthy donors and acute patients and convalescent. I guess I have to, have to read it a hundred times. Yeah, I mean the the figures are a little bit helpful because they keep a constant color scheme. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's really the only way I could keep things straight. All right. So then they looked at dendritic cells, right? Um, Brianne, so give us a give us a primer on dendritic cells. Um, so dendritic cells are. Um, in the simplest version, cells of the innate immune system that do phagocytosis and um, present antigens to activate T cells. They are so really they, good at activating T cells. So they eat garbage and show it to the T cells. Exactly. <laughs> and not only do they show it to the T cells, um, they have um, some other proteins that help really turn the T cells on. Mm. Now they've got something in here about classic dendritic cells versus what is it plasma cytoid, plasma cytoid yes dendritic cells what's the difference so originally the difference was in where sort of what um precursors led to these dendritic cells um but these dendritic cells also have a somewhat different function and the conventional dendritic cells are going to be much better at that t cell activation um, than a plasmacytoid, plasma, yeah, plasmacytoid dendritic cell. <laughs> so CDCs, CDCs are better antigen presenters than PDCs. Correct. Okay. All right. All right, and so they find that the there's a, there's an increase in conventional DCs in the convalescent group, right? which I guess is what you expect because they're helping to respond to infection. Um, and they have this idea that the, um, the activation of DCs is defective, right? And they actually check that by adding uh, maturation cytokine. So I guess when the DC sees a, a foreign antigen, it becomes activated, right, before it, prevents it presents it to the T cells. Exactly. So they think so there's some problem. Immature and mature dendritic cells. Yeah. Um, and it's, the... the um, immature dendritic cells are really good at the eating part, and the mature dendritic cells are really good at the activating T cells part. Yeah. Over time, I have really warmed up to dendritic cells. I think they're <laughs> just really awesome. Uh, these, if, am I correct that these uh, these are concentrated in in the skin or right under the skin? So they're surveying 
uh, sort of the the main barrier, physical barrier? Um, they're concentrated in lots of different barrier organs. Um, so uh, people may have heard of Langerhans cells. Langerhans cells are really the skin dendritic cells. Okay. Um, but there are similar populations of dendritic cells in other places. Okay. Awesome. So, so I the, love it that they're. The, I mean, these are like these creatures, okay, running around in my body with my genome in them, okay, just looking out for me. Yeah, on their own trip. That's good stuff. Yeah, for sure. Just as you're sitting there, Rich, it's all happening right now. Yeah, right now. It's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yep. you have to think. In, about in fact, this, that's yeah. something I always talk to my immunology students about all the time. Is that the next time their parents yell at them for being lazy, they can tell their parents <laughs> that all of these things that are going on in their body right then. So the bottom line from this section, they say DCs derived from acute patients are functionally impaired for maturation and T cell activation, and therefore they uh, the 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 adaptive T cell responses are going to be reduced as a consequence. Is that a fair conclusion, Brianne? Yeah, that's a fair conclusion. Um, I was sort of uh, simplifying the difference between the dendritic cell subsets in terms yeah. of where they activate T cells um, and things like that. Um, but the idea that um, this uh, reduction in the uh, acute patients of CDCs um, mm -hmm. is going to give them less uh, T cell activation is certainly true. Um, if we look later in this figure, they look a little bit at um, proteins on the surface of the dendritic cells. Um, and that is really what tells me that those dendritic cells are turning on T cells less. Um, there's some proteins mm. here that are really important for um, having the dendritic cell turn on T cells. And right. there are some um, definite differences there. Okay. In the next section, they look at CD4 and CD8 cells from uh, acute patients. And they, I don't want to go into all the assays. That's, that's for immune. But um, they conclude that infection leads to a functional impairment of both CD4 and CD8 T cell subsets in these patients. Fair good assays. Fair conclusion, Brian. Yeah, that that is a fair conclusion. Um, they're bringing me back to my uh, dissertation days um, mm -hmm. with some of these assays. Um, most of them are looking at the ability of the T cells to divide or to produce different cytokines. Mm -hmm. um, and in the uh, acute or convalescent patients, uh, particularly the acute patients, we have reduced proliferation and reduced cytokine production. Well, before I forget it, you know, this is the message here: is that the viruses. Some viral gene product is doing something to immune cells, more than one, most likely. And that, to me, is the most interesting part. What viral proteins are doing this and how, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that um, one thing that's really interesting is that it looks like there's impairments of the dendritic cells and monocytes as well as the T cells. And mm -hmm. so it could be that the impaired dendritic cells and monocytes are the sort of the key point. They're just not activating T cells well. Um, and so maybe the, the issue is that the virus is messing with dendritic cells or monocytes, yeah, yeah. or maybe it's actually acting on the T cells. Um, it's not really clear, although I've seen some other data um, that make me wonder about those dendritic cells and monocytes. Okay. So the effect on T cells could be a downstream effect of, of a secondary effect of messing with the monocytes and uh, dendritic cells. It could be, yeah. Uh, downstream, or it could be direct on the T cells. That's sort of a, a you know future thing that I'd love to run over to the lab right now and start doing. <laughs> you have to wait till TWIV is over. I know. <laughs> we, we need your uh, we need your thoughts here. All right, the next part they're looking at these M macrophage monocyte derived suppressive cells, and the conclusion is that um, so they look in serious and recovered patients and. They say high conventional to plasmacytoid DC ratios of about 50-fold may serve as a potential biomarker of severe illness because this is what they observe in um, these, these severely ill patients. How do you think about that, Brianne? Um, I think that that's really uh, an interesting thing. I don't know how many um, hospital labs could do 
the yeah. cytometry they've done here yeah. um, in order to look at this as a biomarker. I think they said they used 12 color flow cytometry. Mm. Um, but it does look like um, a, a pretty dramatic difference. I'd love to see some, um, you know, to really think about comparing this to the uh, healthy donors as well, which it's hard to do with the way they've got these figures set up. The next section, they look at antibody responses and compare them to T cells. And they make this interesting observation that um, some of the patients, you get high antibody titers and neutralizing antibody titers, but low T cell responses. Uh, so, for example, three um, of these mild infections had high neutralizing antibody titers, but low T cell responses to the nuclear protein, NP. And two of these had weak Re um, receptor binding domain specific T cells. Four out of four severe patients did not develop measurable T cell responses against either the nuclear protein or the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. And then two mild cases had increased NP T cells, but not RBD specific T cells. So they're saying that you know, you may get high antibody responses, but if you have low T cell responses to NP and uh, the, the receptor binding domain, that's what you really need for recovery from infection. And sort of right. what we've, we've been saying for a long time, right, Brianne? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. Um, I think that's sort of interesting that they were thinking about neutralizing antibodies against both the receptor binding domain and NP. Yeah. Um, because, um, you know, the receptor binding domain is part of spike. That's the protein that's in many of the um, vaccines that people are really thinking about as something that drives antibodies. Um, and here they were looking at some other types of antibodies and seeing some some nice differences in them. Um, and those the, antibodies wouldn't happen from the vaccine. That's one of the reasons why I think the spike focus is not so smart because we know we have known that NP antibodies can neutralize, you know, I mean, the spike approach is, is an obvious, yeah, we make antibodies against the spike, which is important for attachment. We'll, we'll neutralize, but there are other ways that you can neutralize and NP is one of them. So they conclude that NP specific T cells are likely needed for reducing disease, disease severity and viral control during acute infection. I think it's really important because again, most of the vaccines are focused on spike, not NP. And they're not even focused on T cells, right? They're measuring neutralizing responses. Right. I mean, I think one nice thing is that spike is a pretty big protein. Um, and so it probably does have some T cell epitopes. Um, but this sort of makes some sense in that antibodies are often really important for neutralization and keeping cells from getting infected. Mm -hmm. And T cells are often really important for getting rid of cells that are already yeah. infected. And so yeah. you can see how if you actually want to completely clear the virus or help someone recover, um, you can't just get you can't just stop new cells from being infected. You have to actually get rid of some of those virus production factories of the sure. already infected cells. Makes perfect That's sense, it. right? So I don't know if we've already said this, but uh, N stands for nucleic acid, which is the a protein that uh, is made in abundance and coats the genome to sort of, uh, it does a lot of things, but I think of it as sort of a coating that sort of stabilizes uh, and protects it. So, um, I don't know, I have this, uh, it, the the notion that I might be making an immune response to N gives me a sort of a warm and fuzzy feeling, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the right thing to do. But at any rate, it's going to be an abundant viral product. Okay. Uh, last, the last section, I uh, would just want to, it, it emphasizes this, what they call an inverted uh, observation, that is strong antibody responses, weak T cell responses. And they say this inverted antibody, strong antibody, weak CD8 T cell response might be immune features of acute infection. And um, they, they, as they say this, well, they say this is uh, the first time that... Um, this has been observed. Where is that? <sighs> to the best of our knowledge, is the first to report DC functionality and imbalanced antibody and T cell responses during the acute phase. And they say the, the results are important for design of an effective vaccine. And I would agree with that for sure. But I, I do think we need more patients to look at. It's a yeah. limited number. 
one thing that would be really interesting is to understand which part of the virus was um, inducing this uh, immune change. Yeah. Um, because you might want to make sure that that is not in the vaccine so that you can induce a good T cell response. If you had a version of the virus without whatever this inhibitory protein is. Yeah. yeah. Well, could be really let's helpful. hope it's not spike. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because that's what's in most of the vaccines. But yeah, I I I think of experiments where you systematically delete uh you know, they have all these small uh, accessory proteins they're called encoded in the right-hand part of the genome and we, a lot of them we don't know what they do. It would be interesting to remove one at a time and see, but you'd need an animal model to that duplicates this um uh effect on immune cells, right? And I'm not sure that we have one yet. Right. Um, they do show in some of their figures um, differences in uh, interferon production um, from some of the innate immune cells. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, you could maybe do some tests also to look for um, individual viral proteins and their ability to um, inhibit interferon. Right. And so all of which we will see in the coming years. As people get down to the basic science here, not that I've thought about doing those experiments. Um, so one of one of my frustrations with uh, the not having the convalescent patients well defined is that I assume that over time things will return to normal uh, in these individuals, but there's no indication here. There's very little indication of what the time scale is for convalescence mm. or when that will happen. Yeah. yeah. Is it, is it an exaggeration to say that the virus is immunosuppressive? Um, I would say no, it is not an exaggeration to say that, but um, I tend to think about viruses and immunosuppression a lot. So, well, is, um, but then so the that was my next... That, the consequence, Rich, yes, but then the consequence is that you have dysregulation, right? Right. So it's not a broad immunosuppression right. that hits everything, right. but it, it suppresses some responses. Exactly. So, so that brings me to my next question: Is that what other viruses do this or something similar, and what's known about how they do it? Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind um, is the Michael Minna measles story. Um, that uh, measles is. Um, hitting memory B cells um, and getting rid of antibody production. Um, and I'm not sure that the mechanism of that is really well understood. Um, yeah. So there are a few viruses, but I'm not sure that we can really say um, exact details. I mean, obviously with HIV, we can talk about um, mechanisms of suppression, but this is pretty different than that. Right. Sorry, so in the case of does. measles, there's an immunosuppression, but it's uh, the characteristics are quite different. Exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah. unique to B cells, whereas here it looks like B cells are the one thing that aren't really touched. Right. Okay. Yeah. And measles virus also infects APCs, antigen-presenting cells, and, and skews the the TH response as a consequence. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. Did sorry. we actually say that this virus, they do the in vitro experiments and this virus is not infecting the dendritic cells directly yeah, uh, in that's right. culture? That's right. Um, SARS-1 does some kind of immunosuppression because there's no long, there's no B cells long-term. There's no memory B cells, yet there are long-term T cells present, virus-specific T cells. So... Um, this is similar in some aspects because here the T cell response, um, well, um, no, I don't want to say that, but SARS-1 definitely has some features and, and it's pointing us to the T cells as being long lasting and important. It, it is. And from the, the small number of proteins that I've heard of with SARS-1, um, a lot of them seem to influence the um, dendritic cells and monocytes in their ability yeah. to activate those T cells. Um, and people are trying to compare different parts of the genomes with those proteins. I do want to emphasize that there's relatively little work done on the coronaviruses in general up until now. Even after SARS-1, very few laboratories. You know, there were more than before, but still very few, despite the importance. And now I think a lot more, I mean, everybody's interested. Every immunology lab is interested. And, uh, you know, before they wouldn't have been, but I think we're going to understand a lot of basic 
science that we need to to really understand this and understand interactions of viruses with the immune system in general, not just to make a vaccine, right? Oh, absolutely. I think that one of the things that has come out of all of this for me is a really nice list of some basic immunology and basic virology questions that um, have been exposed um, as a result of this whole thing that we maybe need some answers to. Um, and so hopefully we can start to design some experiments to get those answers for both this virus and for just the field in general. Brian, you, Brian, you need to convince Drew to build a BSL-3. That would be fine with me. Because it's it's not hugely expensive, right? And it can be done. And you can argue it's a great training uh, thing as well. Oh, absolutely. But, I'm sure that having my students have that on their uh, CV yeah. would help yeah. them out quite a bit. Absolutely. Well, if you suggest to them they ought to put together a BSL-3 and they say, yes, you know who's in charge. <laughs> <laughs> be prepared. That's true. Yeah. I, I they, made they, it a they, policy anytime I was going to suggest something to be ready to volunteer to do it. So, uh, of course, then there's BSL-3s for virus and then ABSL-3 for virus infected animals. They're two different animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have uh, BSL-3s at Columbia, but not ABSL-3. So we were in the process of certifying ABSL-3 for SARS-CoV-2 work in animals. And I was asked to sit on that committee and uh, I, I said yes. So, you know, we have to decide, we have to pre, uh, triage. We have, to, not everyone can get in at the same time because it's a small facility. So we have to decide what proposals go first, which is hard, I think, to do. Very, very hard to do. Yeah, we're doing that too. <clears throat> um, there's a little pedantry from Kathy before we move to emails. Oh, I was just going to say one thing about this paper too. Uh, it's under consideration at Cell Press and has not been peer reviewed. Um, it actually... What? <laughs> so yeah. I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. Okay. Um, it actually went on uh, Immunity's website as accepted yesterday. I see. Okay. <laughs> because the the version that I'm looking at, I did this sneak peek thing. And um, so every page on it tells you that it's not been peer reviewed, but this makes sense now. Okay. Yeah. With, with my rabbit hole looking for the supplementals, I... Uh, looked at a lot of that. <laughs> okay. I think, though, um, here on Twitter, we do some kind of peer review. Right. And uh, people who are listening can learn from that, as we can learn as well. Anything else before we go on to email? Did you want to say anything, Kathy? No. Um, okay. But I was going to do this follow-up uh, when I was listening to the episode uh, with – the discussion about Sarbeco virus and Dixon asked what it is. I know we've said it before, but uh, Sarbeco comes from a, a couple letters from each of these words, SARS, beta, coronavirus. So sar be -co. Uh, So that's one way you can remember that. And for people who maybe didn't realize it at the beginning, that a way to remember which kind of vaccine Moderna is making, it's in their name, mode RNA. Uh, comes out to be Moderna. And just just like that, I always like to point out to my students, if they, you know, get a question on an exam, what kind of virus is a picornavirus? Well, it's right in the name, Pico RNA. So, uh, Pico meaning small, and it's an RNA virus. So, sometimes you can uh, learn something about the names from uh, the, the viruses or the entities uh, based on their names. That'd be a good name for a company, Picorna. Yeah. <laughs> but you'd have to make something. All right, related to Picornis. A small company. It would be a very small company. You think? Yeah. You think so? Yeah. All right. Well, the small point. DNA tumor virus meetings, people would always ask, is it a small meeting or is it small <laughs> DNA virus? <laughs> That's good. I like that. All right, some email. First, uh, we have an email from Susan Weiss, who, of course, was previously on Twif's, Twif 609. Gosh. We're already up to 650. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. I was, I don't we think started we're coronavirus hit. at 585. Amazing. Uh, I don't think we'll hit 700 by the end of the year, but early next year we will. Because we're going to go back to two a week now because I've finished with the backlog of episodes. The unmasked episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the unmasked episodes. 
Susan writes, I really enjoyed TWIV today. This is referring to Fridays, the past Fridays, TWIV. I have a couple of comments about topics discussed. Persistent coronavirus RNA, a big question for uh, mouse hepatitis virus around for many years is how does MHV RNA persist in the central nervous system, probably for the lifetime of the mouse, long after infectious virus is cleared? Uh, MHV- I didn't know about this. MHV causes acute encephalitis followed by chronic demyelinating disease. It's a model for multiple sclerosis. And while virus is cleared by about 10 days post-infection, viral RNA, both genome and mRNA, can be detected for months in the brain and spinal cord. Papers from our lab, Connie Bergman, Susan Baker. Given that there is RNA and mRNAs, we tried very hard to recover infectious virus, initially by immune suppression and later by making brain lysates from mice with persistent RNA and inoculating into the brains of naive mice, a very sensitive assay, and no transmission of virus. The viral RNA persistence remains unexplained. Uh, Detecting RNA by PCR, maybe you discussed this. I have not heard every TWIV. There are some unclear issues, like are the samples for testing, nasal or endotracheal or saliva, containing virus only or infected cells? We could design a test for mRNA specifically by using primers that cross leader uh, leader body boundaries, but this is probably too much for a rapid test, and maybe it wouldn't uh, at least tell us that virus is replicating, as there could be fragments of mRNA as well as genome. But if there were large amounts of mRNA compared to genome, it would suggest replication. Also, when genome copies are quantified, It's not clear for me for any given test whether it is genome copies per microliter, as often expressed, or for the entire patient sample, which is diluted into the test. We found if we have less than 10 to the 5 genome copies per microliter in a clinical sample, we cannot recover infectious virus. But 10 to the 5 copies may only represent 100 platforming units. Coronaviruses definitely make a lot of non-infectious particles. And I think we have no idea how many PFUs are is an infectious dose for humans. We and others around us have calculated genomes per PFU several times and get varying results. Bottom line, it's difficult to know how many genomes are likely to signify viral shedding. Great point. Really important point. <coughs> yeah, it's just a general guideline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, and pointing out also that uh, I, I take away from this that, uh, from her experience with mouse hepatitis virus, she's just as much in the dark about persistence of RNA yeah, as we for are. Sure. Yep. You know, I, uh, during the course of this, I think about SSPE and measles and, uh, cause, uh, that subacute, don't tell me subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, right? A long-term sequelae of a measles virus infection, which is, uh, get me if I'm wrong, but uh, measles subgenomic uh, RNAs in the brain that ultimately cause pathology. Um, yeah, no it's, infectious it's, virus, yeah. No infectious virus. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that that's related to this, but it is another pretty well documented uh, documented me- mechanism of a vi- an RNA virus genome hanging out for a long period of time uh, in the absence of any infectious virus. I think there are a lot of viral RNAs hanging around in the brain without doing much. All right, Kathy, can you take the next one? Sure. Bill writes, I first heard of this last week in a brief news announcement, but as it didn't include any details or links, I only briefly mentioned it to my sister, Kathy. That would be me. Uh, (laughs) This week, CU Boulder put out a more detailed news announcement with a link to the MedArchive preprint, and he puts in the link for that paper. The test uses an RT lamp assay, and the saliva sample, after adding a buffer, is boiled see comment below, and put into three different enzyme mixtures and heated to 65 degrees C for 10 minutes, after which reactions are stopped by heating to 80 degrees C. If the color changes from pink to yellow, the test is positive. I don't fully understand the accuracy discussion. They use 60 contrived saliva samples, 30 positive and 30 negative. All of the negative samples evaluated properly, while 29 of the 30 positive samples were evaluated properly, giving what was described as a sensitivity estimate of 97%. 
it obviously takes 45 minutes rather than 10 minutes, and it requires several enzyme mixtures, which I'd like to think would not be hard to acquire. And then his note about, uh, quote, boiling of saliva. Uh, this was done by immersing the saliva tube in a 95 degree C water bath for 10 minutes. First, I wonder if the saliva was really boiling. And secondly, I note that Boulder, Colorado is 5,328 feet above sea level. And the nominal boiling point of water at this altitude is 94.65 degrees centigrade <laughs> Celsius. So, sounds like your brother, Gabby. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so um, so I uh, really like this paper. Uh, it's a preprint and C uh, Sarah Sawyer is a senior author. Uh, from uh, Boulder, and uh, Sarah's been on TWIV in the past, and uh, that was TWIV 193, live at ASV in Madison, July 2012, and she was also on TWIVO this week in Evolution, uh, episode five. And so, uh, although there's several papers out there, uh, Vincent points out that there's one from uh, Columbia, another CU group, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I like uh, several things in this uh, paper from the Sawyer lab. They uh, talk about this saliva issue um, and, and basically they have the individual spit into a tube until there's a mill there. And then they add this quote buffer. Um, they call it a buffer. And now I'm trying to find it in the materials and methods of what it consists of, but they talk about how they have to, um, deal with the fact that different saliva samples are going to have different acidity. And so sometimes they get some samples where the saliva itself makes the test uh, turn color and, and look as if it's positive. And so they talk about the uh, particular amount or con final concentration of sodium hydroxide that they have to have in this. And um, I'm still not finding it in the materials and methods. I have a lamp primer design. Uh, oh, yeah. It, they call it 2x stabilization buffer, 5 millimolar TSEP. Don't know what that is. Uh, uh, it's a buffer. Okay. And, uh, and then 29 millimolar sodium hydroxide, proteinase K. Uh, and they add it one to one with saliva. And so the person taking their own sample would uh, spit into this tube and uh, add the buffer uh, and then shake it up. And then that doesn't uh, kill the virus, but then they put it in this boiling 95 degree bath and that enables the virus to become inactivated. And they also do controls about how long they have to put it in this 95 degree bath and they figure out that uh, they could go for 10 or 15 minutes, but they opt for 10 because that makes the overall assay a little bit shorter. They probably could get away with three minutes, but they want to make absolutely certain that the virus is inactivated. And they point out that they don't want to go too long because you'll start getting degradation of the RNA. And uh, they, they also control for the EDTA and then they, uh, talk about which primers to use and so forth. And, uh, oh, then uh, they're uh, submitting an IRB to do a bigger trial of this. Uh, and they estimate that to meet some kind of guidelines, uh, they have to have at least 2,000 to 4,000 participants uh, in, the tr in the trial to make this work. But it's the kind of thing that uh, uh, yeah, to, in order to see, to achieve the 20 positive samples uh, that are necessary for the emergency use authorization guidelines of June 10th, 2020. So, oh, and they have to have matched nasal swabs for these samples. So that's why they uh, have to uh, go on and, and do an IRB kind of thing. So, so it's multi multiple groups are doing these lamp sort of saliva. There's a paper out of Columbia University, field deployable rapid diagnostic testing, and they make the note that lamp is sensitive to inhibitors in saliva, and they had to get around that. And these are all interesting, and they're better 
in the sense that they can be done more quickly and more broadly than quantitative PCR, but not every place will be able to do this. I mean, and the strip, the paper strip, the one dollar paper strip of Michael Minna still seems to me uh, the the most accessible. You don't need any equipment for it, right? And so right. Uh, this you need a something to heat up the samples at least, right? Right. You need to get the enzymes, so you really can't do this at home. So right, the the paper strip test, uh, you have to have the antibodies. I mean, yeah, it's printed on the paper, right? Right. So you you buy so, the paper but, strips, right? But this one you have but to have stuff. Instance, if, right. If our department were going to do the paper strip tests, we would have to get these antibodies. Well, uh, assuming you wanted to make them and not purchase them, but I would think an right. academic place like yours, you could do the the lamp saliva test on you exactly know as long as it's validated. What we're working yeah. on. Yeah. Oh, so, and the other thing for controls, they they talk about um, needing to spike in, and I think this is the question, the thing that uh, Bill wasn't quite sure about the contrived saliva samples, where you take just clean saliva from a presumably uninfected person and you spike in mm. some either viral RNA or what they did was uh, use heat inactivated virus for their controls. So that, and the idea is that the RNA, uh, naked RNA would get destroyed in this buffer, but when it's first in there in cells, it doesn't get destroyed. So. Yeah, it's not naked. Yeah, that's the contrived samples. I <clears throat> took the same thing from that, is that they're spiked. And as a matter of fact, that reminds me that we have seen numerous papers, well, I, not as many as I would like, that assay infectious virus in clinical samples. And in none of those have I seen a control where they take a serum from uninfected individuals and spike it with virus and do the same test to determine the limits of detection of the test, okay? And that just frustrates me no end. Yeah, that's so, a really great point. I think that this also allows you to um, further understand if there are things like inhibitors in the saliva mm -hmm. um, that get rid of uh, your signal once you actually spike in known positive signal. Mm -hmm. So these, these saliva lamp or whatever the detection technology is are great for institutions where you have lab capability and say you have a lot of students present but um, for schools or, or like, firemen <laughs> wherever you can get it approved it has to be approved right um, it has to be a test that's approved but you have to have lab capability and uh, a high school m probably wouldn't be able to do it, but they could yeah. do the uh, this paper strip with the antibody on it, right? They could just buy them. So it really depends on the situation. And I think it's fine to have all kinds of ingenuity bearing into this. But remember, if you're still developing the test and you have to validate it in people and get the FDA approval, it's going to take months to do that. Uh, Brienne, could you take the next one, please? Sure. Eric writes... I'm writing from Portland, Oregon, currently 68 Fahrenheit and clear at 1 a.m. PST. I'm a sculptor and graphic designer, and I keep hearing countering a miasma of anti-think in my head, which seems to pair nicely with what I've been saying too often these days. We're drowning in an ocean of stupidity. Anyway, I figured I'd take a stab at designing a shirt featuring the famous line. Images are attached as well as print files if you're into that sort of thing. I really enjoy the podcast and recommend it to all of my friends. Thanks for all you do, Eric. Um, and he's seen, he has these images of T-shirts, and they're really cool. Yeah, I, I do, I do want to replace the virus because it's not really the – I understand yeah. that it's a graphic artist's interpretation, but I asked him if I could change it to the actual – Twib virus, the and then I'll then I'll, the then I'll put them on Cafe Press and uh, Zazzle and whatever, and people can buy them because I think it's yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and just to remind everybody that the statement about the countering a miasma of anti-think came from Twib six thirty two. That was Jim from St. Louis. Wow, Which, Kathy. <laughs> well, I'm thinking that you know he should probably get a T-shirt. Yeah, but. <laughs> So, uh, but you know, tracking yeah. that down. Good for oh, you. it was also the show title that made it easy. Right. Oh, that would help. <laughs> uh, Rich, can you take the next one? 
Kyle writes, huge fan of the show. I actually came across the show through Dr. Vincent Racaniello by way of his lecture on macrophage.co. I've been listening to the episodes on COVID-19, naturally, and I had somewhat of an epiphany. Is it possible that ACE2 is highly conserved across animal taxa, which could explain the success of COVID-2 transmission from different animal species, most recently the tiger cases? I know that there are examples of certain biological molecules that are conserved, so I'm curious if this may be uh, such another case. I did a cursory search of the literature, but found no references. My background is in evolutionary biology, and I teach uh, A and P, and I'm definitely planning on incorporating what I'm learning about SARS-CoV-2 uh, and others in my lecture. Best, Kyle. So, yeah, the tiger ACE2 is pretty close to the human ACE2, right? Which is mm -hmm. one of the reasons that it can cross species. Uh, so that is... Uh, and there is conservation in some other species that I think correlates at least to some extent with uh, cross-species transmission of the virus. Am I right? I think yeah, so. But, but uh, um, you know, bat has, bats have ACE2, but it's, it's different from human ACE2. And you don't need human high-affinity binding ACE2 to, to infect a bat, so… And, and the mouse ACE2 is rather different, which is why they had to uh, adapt the virus in one of the earlier papers we talked about. So uh, I would point out at the same time that um, uh, I would uh, predict that ACE2 is not the only barrier to, uh, to you know, cross-species uh, transmission. If you don't have the right ACE2, if you don't have the right receptor, that is going to be a barrier. If you do... Uh, that's you're, you're only getting a virus in. There are many other ways to inhibit a virus infection, uh, intracellular and 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 otherwise. But ACE2 is going to be one of those barriers. It would be necessary, but not sufficient for viral reproduction. In fact, so when there's the right receptor on a cell, we call that cell susceptible. And then what happens beyond the receptor, beyond virus entry, all the other stuff you need that Rich was referring to is called permissivity very specific terms. Don writes, Twivers, fortunately, I did not have to send you a message about Amy Schumer. But I do want to point out that the Jonestown Massacre used flavor aid, not Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it's, I think that's where the drinking the Kool-Aid came from, right? Yeah. Right. The Wikipedia article really explains it all. Um I mean, saying drunk the flavor aid just doesn't have the same ring. No, <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> no, I love the show. Boy, Kool Aid must be upset about this, or, or I don't know. Or they would have been then too. Yeah. yeah. Or, or or is Flavor Aid upset about it? <laughs> well, but there's no such thing as bad publicity, is there? <laughs> I guess not. Uh, but, we have, but they're of missing out. Flavor Aid is missing out on yeah. being. Uh, yeah. In a saying. Being a meme. Yeah. I, l I love the show, even though you guys often say infectious dose, which is a misnomer. Median infectious dose would be better. All right. All right, folks. Why <laughs> is it? Antic. Great. Why is it median infectious dose? I mean, if I, if I dilute a sample and infect the mouse, it's the infectious dose I'm giving the mouse, no? I mean, median, I, I don't know. I suppose it depends what if you're talking about a measurement afterward or a practical matter of what you're giving the mouse yeah. at the time. Whatever you uh, give the mouse is the maybe infectious if, dose. Maybe if you, uh, uh, maybe if you're asking what the infectious dose is, okay, maybe in order to determine that, you got to in, infect uh, a whole bunch of mice with a whole bunch of uh, different doses and determine the median infectious dose. Yeah. Statistically. Yeah, well, actually, we don't usually do median. You do 50% endpoints typically, right? And that's not a median. No, we do fifty percent endpoints in animals typically. So, Don, explain yourself. <laughs> All right, um, <laughs> this this, uh, this is, reminds me to to say we had a couple of letters complaining that on the uh, JAMA paper we did last week. I think it was Wednesday where they looked at <clears throat> RNA levels in kids of different ages and found that you know. Young kids have a lot of RNA, viral RNA, SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA. Remember the whisker plots? So we said they, they were the error bars, and they said they're not error bars. They're the range of values, actually, 
Right. So the box and then the whiskers on the top and bottom are the range of values. We call them error bars. Okay, you're right. They're, they're, they're the range of values. The error, is, error would be c- calculated a different way. <clears throat> Brianne, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Paul writes, <clears throat> I've been hearing a lot of trumpeting today about the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine candidates going to phase three or two, three trials. But until now, I've heard mostly about Chinese and Oxford candidates. This is the RAPS summary of the advanced candidates as of July 23rd. Have Moderna and Pfizer jumped to the top of this list? Are they in third Moderna and fifth Pfizer places? Do Pfizer and Moderna just have better PR machines than the Chinese, the BCG group, and Oxford? Um, And he gives uh, a table um, of the vaccine tracker. Uh, Okay. Um, I don't know how they rate rank these, and I frankly don't think it matters. It uh, looks the fact like they're is, rated in terms of trial phase. The yeah, phase three phase ones three are at the, the top, top, and then two, three, and then... I mean, these are the ones that should be on the top, the ones that are in humans, right? And the right. more advanced they are, the better. So, But, you know, the BCG is 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 going to be an indirect I- immunization, right? It's not, it's not, mm-hmm. not going to last forever, so... I don't even even know that's way up there because it's already a vaccine for uh, tuberculosis. Right. I I mean, part of why I feel like we hear a lot about Moderna and Pfizer is because they've recently published data. They've published data. They are on the um, Operation Warp Speed list and uh, active and all that stuff. Yeah. So the uh, the inactivated the inactivated vaccine out of uh, Sinopharm uh, is is in phase three and it's. moving very quickly. I'm looking at the uh, WHO draft draft landscape. Uh, I just looked at this last night for some reason. So this is as of 31st of July, the most recent download that I can get. And they, they've they actually changed their format a little bit so that you can very easily see who's in what phase. And they list one, two, three, four, five, six vaccines in phase three trials. That includes uh, the Chadox Oxford vaccine, uh, three different inactivated uh, vaccines, all from China, uh, and the Moderna vaccine uh, and the uh, Pfizer vaccine, both uh, mRNA vaccines. And they don't have any, you know, there's no particular priority. If you want to go and look at the, uh, they have links to all the clinical trials for uh, all of those phase three trials. And I'm sure if you looked at those, you could find out uh, what the dates are for when they enrolled and uh, what they uh, expect their progress to be. But beyond that, I think that uh, uh, any sort of priority, if you like, in air quotes is just publicity. Yeah. And, and I think that those six are six of the eight on this table that he sent. And personally, I wouldn't take any of these until I know the six and 12 month durability of the protection because there's such fast track now that they're going to be within a couple of months seeing they protect you against infection right after vaccination, but you know, and and they will do long-term observations, but what if the protection goes away after six or 12 months? That's a big issue and it's not going to be factored in because these things are going to be licensed right away. I frankly would wait to know which one lasts after a year <laughs> and take that one, unless you want to keep getting boosted uh, every year. Oh, I think year, I'd rather, I'll, I'll get boosted again so that I can, you know, go out and live my life. Yeah. yeah. You are living gonna, your I'll, life. I'll, I'll, I'll go for it and I'll report back to you, Vincent. <laughs> oh, I, I don't, I'm fine doing what I'm doing. Um, I don't need to do any of these things, but I don't. I mean, boosting is fine also. I'm just trying to emphasize that we're leaving a big thing out of these early uh, vaccine trials, the durability, because we're not looking at it. We're going to license this thing before a normal durability evaluation of the vaccine. And I understand we need to get people back to their lives, but all right, get a, you want to get one every six months. Do you think that would be an option? Is that a manufacturing option? I guess if you have enough vaccines manufactured, yeah, you could get all sorts of You know, we're, uh, these vaccines are going to be just the first generation, just the first stab at this, and much the same as the, the first shingles stab. vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> well, even polio, right, started off with the inactivated vaccine. Six years later, we had the uh, the oral vaccine. 
The, yeah, but we're still using the same inactivated polio vaccine basically as was originally true. licensed. And we're all switching back to it because it's less dangerous. Uh, so that was durable, um, which is really remarkable for an activated vaccine that it is so durable. <clears throat> but it's not forever. It, you do need to have boosters periodically. The inactivated vaccine also is not va- – uh, the attenuated vaccine is also not forever, curiously. But it's not, it's better than a year <laughs> or six months. That's the point. Um, Rich is next. Is that right? Yeah. No, Rich. you skipped no. me. <laughs> Who are you again? <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm Kathy. I'm very sorry. Go ahead, Kathy. It's okay. Kathy. It's Take- okay. All right. I like this one, so I'm happy to have it. Amy writes, hello to the TWIV team. I am just a child psychiatrist who had been turned on to TWIV by my children's pediatrician, whose husband is an infectious disease epidemiologist. And after years of anxiety about the next flu pandemic, I called her in mid-January when reading about SARS-CoV-2 and said, this is it. And she responded, yes. When I went to telehealth in early March, my patients thought I was overreacting and kept insisting they would see me back in the office in two to three weeks. And I corrected them that the two to three was correct, but it would be more like years. (laughs) Despite despite disliking the way infectious disease was taught in medical school, I find virology and microbiology incredibly interesting and understand that microbes were here long before us and will be here long after we are gone. I want you to know that one of the only things that keeps me calm and sane while working full-time from home, taking care of my two small children, supporting my husband, who is their primary caregiver, and supporting my friends and patients, has been your smart, thoughtful, humorous, and sophisticated discussions on all things COVID. It calms me to know there are thoughtful people out there metabolizing all this data and thinking deeply about not only the virus, but the implications of our policies and our practices. My good friends call it my COVID porn. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for the work you do. I will continue to be a supportive listener, and I'm so grateful for this podcast. I know you're working hard, and it is much appreciated. Stay well, Amy. So, yeah. Isn't, isn't like COVID porn a bad connotation? <laughs> I think we had. I think we have something like that in one of the suggested um, uh, titles. No, I don't see it. Yeah, it oh, was yes, based on this COVID letter. porn. Was, yeah, because this letter was put up a, a week ago, but we never got to it. But I'm not sure it's a good connotation, right? Is there a definition? Oh, a ju- the judge said, I'll let you know when I see it, right? I can't define right. it. Yeah. <laughs> I just wonder if it goes beyond, you know, the usual stuff. Um, you know, does the word have a meaning beyond, you know? Well, it's acquiring a meaning uh, a meaning uh, beyond porno, but beyond what we, Yeah. Yeah, things with no uh, I've heard it value, used in yeah. other contexts like uh something, you know, uh visual or or uh or a podcast or some something that I experience that I'm getting addicted to that's not a drug. Because right. you know the definition right. includes of no value, right? And I don't think Twib is <laughs> of no value, right? No. All right. Well thank you, Amy. Uh Rich. Uh hang on, I lost myself here because I was up pasting in titles you're in texas uh oh thank you very much oh there's fact, Amy. that's where this okay. email is from <laughs> david this writes hi perfect. vincent on twiv 648 an email asked if the kind of rapid testing that mike minna is advocating has been tested in a community trial the gates foundation is sponsoring such a trial scan s-c-a-n the work was halted by the FDA in May, but has since restarted. And he gives links to both those statements. Here's the preliminary results of prior, uh, preliminary results prior to halting of the trial and gives a link to a report. An important finding, 87% of respondents with a positive result had not sought in-person clinical care before enrolling in SCAN, so at-home testing does quickly identify many new cases of COVID-19. Keep up the great work, David. P.S. Full disclosure, my company is developing COVID-19 diagnostics, but we are not involved with the SCAN study. And David is uh, an MD, PhD in Austin, Texas. Awesome. Hey, Angstrom Bio, that's a good name. Uh, I need to, because I'm on a sort of a, 
uh, an email circulation list with a number of individuals around here in Austin who have been talking about this rapid testing. And I need to uh, get David into this loop. If I'm not mistaken, this is the same uh, David that was used to be associated with the University of Michigan 10 years ago, oh. and it's written several times before. I don't think it is, because uh, I have it's different had email addresses. It's the same middle address. initial. Yeah, I know, but I get different email addresses. Maybe he sent this from oh, the company. Oh, okay. So, so maybe there are two of them then. Let me look. Well, I can't look now. It's on another. Right. Yeah, I thought, I okay. wondered that too, but um, okay. I thought he was retired, you know. Uh, Vincent, I want to look into this. Can you send me David's email address or something mm -hmm, like that? Mm -hmm. And anyway, this is good. Uh, I didn't realize the Gates was involved because a number of people are saying, why aren't the Gates Foundation involved in this MENA stuff? And this is good. So they're doing some rapid testing. So very good. And obviously this was ongoing before because um, it's from May. Jackie writes... I am writing you from Burlington, Ontario, Canada, where it's 19C66F. I started listening after Malcolm Gladwell recommended in April. I've been an avid listener since. My husband and I are just humble musicians. He plays the trombone and I play the saxophone. We perform with groups that range in size from a quartet to full orchestra. As you are aware, our industry has been completely shut down and it appears that it will be for some time to come. This has been challenging on a few levels but it has been especially difficult socially as playing music with other people is part of what keeps us sane. I'm truly grateful to have found your podcast and I'm learning so much. I admire you all because you still have an awe-inspiring zest for learning. Music and science are very similar in that you are never done learning new things about them. I've always told my students that music is infinite. So too, it seems, is virology. My question is, does SARS-CoV-2 pose any health risks to the native bat populations in North and South America? Is there any evidence that humans can spread viruses to bats? Would the native populations have had some exposure to coronaviruses already? Would it be like a mild cold for the bats, or would it pose a more catastrophic health situation for them? Many thanks again for giving us truthful and up-to-date information for debunking the conspiracy theories. This podcast is a beacon of light in this dark and scary time. I enjoy the camaraderie and the banter. Please stay safe and please keep on rack and yelling. <laughs> oh, it's a very good question. So I have to say, first, I'm doing a Twivo this afternoon with Simon Anthony, who samples bat populations in different countries. So we'll ask him more about this. But as you know, this virus came from a bat in China. And so those bats were okay with it. Whether other bats in other countries are okay with it or not is not clear. We'll find out. But there are certainly SARS-like coronaviruses in bats or, or closely related viruses in bats in other countries for sure. And we'll talk more about that with Simon or Anthony. And would, would native populations have had some exposure? For sure. These are old viruses in bats. And, you know... I, the, the populations weren't that big, I suppose. And so, you know, when, when there was an initial spillover from bats of a brand new virus, it may have caused an outbreak and no one would have recorded this, right? No one, there was no medicine, there was no science as we know it today. And then eventually that virus became a common cold virus. Uh, so yeah, I'm sure they did. As we saw from Peter Dashak's twiv, People in the countryside in China have antibodies to these SARS-like coronaviruses. So these are all really good questions um, yeah. if we don't have answers yet. So so one thing I would point out to Jackie, and this is more because it's something I learned about as I started to learn more about infectious disease. So I didn't know it, so I'm thinking maybe some of our listeners might not. Um, is that bats are 20% of all mammals, and there are a lot of kinds of bats. Um, they are divided up into many different types of groups. Um, they're in a group called Chiaptera, and some are called Yang, and some are called Yin Chiaptera. Um, and so um, the uh, North and South American bats are a pretty different group of bats. They fall into a different um, subgroup than the bats that we find in China. Um, so um, that's one thing to sort of be aware of is that they're not 
it's not as if the bats here are exactly the same species as the bats that this virus came from, um, but you're still asking great questions and we don't know about the specific bat species that are here. I want to uh, point out that it's because this is a new listener from non-science that it's uh, not uncommon at all to have situations where a virus is uh, essentially equilibrated with one species in a fashion where it uh, uh, circulates and uh, individuals in the species are infected with the virus, but it doesn't cause any signs or symptoms whatsoever. It just is sort of coexistence. Uh, and then these Signs, actually, signs. Well, we don't know about signs. There are definitely signs because there's virus in them and there probably are cytokines being made. But symptoms from the outside view, that's what we're talking right. about. Uh, and and it's not uncommon in situations where uh, uh, a virus can then wind up spilling over, as we say, into another species. And that's now a non-equilibrium situation where they haven't worked out their relationship. And sometimes that works out to be uh, a nasty uh, infection. I'd recommend a book called Spillover that describes uh, by David Quammen that describes uh, a lot of this stuff. And one of the things that you're asking, so it's, it's perfectly reasonable. I don't know the answer to this. Maybe Vincent will fill us in from Twivo, but uh, I wouldn't, uh, I would think it's perfectly reasonable that uh, this, this and many other coronaviruses infect bats without causing them any problem at all. And they just uh, they just live with it. It's also not at all unreasonable that the virus could spill back from humans into bats and other species. We just we don't have any data that I know of. Yeah, it's hard right. enough to to sample bats in China for these viruses. I mean, let alone sample them for SARS-CoV-2. Right? It needs to be done. I agree. Um, and I would also say, she says she admires us all because we have an awesome, inspiring zest for lear learning. I have a particular uh, admiration for people who uh, play music at the level that a professional musician must play because I, uh, what little contact I have with that, I imagine that to be another spiritual realm that mm -hmm. I've missed out on. Okay, that I would in another life I would love to experience. So good on you, Kathy. You can take the next two. How's that? Uh oh. Um, no, tell me. Want to? I Dominic. Zoomed up. Dominic. Dominic. Okay, hang on. Okay, <laughs> Dominic writes. Hey, shoot for the moon, but twenty to thirty k downloads, twenty to thirty thousand downloads per episode is amazing for a one plus hour conversational, educational, non-scripted podcast. You're doing fantastic. Just a legislative analyst, Dominic. And Bradley writes, I enjoy Hold on, your podcast, I have a comment. I have a oh, comment. Hold on. Oh sorry. Long unscripted is the new normal, folks. Get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. That's okay. All right. Bradley writes, I enjoy your podcast, but feel you just danced around the problem of the mRNA trial. My concern as an ID physician and recovering vaccinologist is that the immunological mechanisms of protection against COVID are simply not known. The authors are measuring, measuring neutralizing antibody, which as they point out, are correlates of protection. If one would wish to, quote, prove this, or at least provide more direct evidence, one correct experiment is to take Sarah from rhesus macaques who have recovered from either COVID challenge or vaccination and inject it into naive macaques and then challenge them with COVID. I predict, based on similar studies being done decades ago on influenza challenge in mice, that the lungs would be protected from challenge, but not the upper airways, which require mucosal immunity. It was pointed out, I think by Brianne, that mucosal immunity was not measured in the Moderna trial and I think that's likely because it is so much easier to measure serum factors. This apparent flaw in their study gains even more importance because it appears that the initial infection with COVID occurs in the nasopharynx, the attachment to ACE2 receptors. What do you think, Bradley? Holy cow. I wonder, Bradley, uh, this gentleman has a last name that um, I know a person who is Bradley, this last name. I wonder if it's the same person. <laughs> ID uh, physician. Yeah. yeah, that fits. Recovering vaccinologist could be. Wow. 
Bradley, ping me. Uh, yeah, all true, Bradley. <laughs> yeah, we've talked about Free all Bradley. this, right? I think some of the – I have seen papers where they take Sierra uh, from immunized animals and transfer it to another and protect them. I don't remember which paper it was in, but that's been done at least once. But uh, these issues, haven't we talked about um, – the correlates and that it basically we're bypassing it. We're assuming that anti-spike antibodies are the correlates of protection and we're bypassing all that because of the pandemic, right? Yes. My Bradley friend has the same middle initial. Got to be the same guy. Hello, Brad. Okay. okay. Where another, have you uh, been? Another Glad thing. you're listening. Good guy. Um, Brianne, you're next. Sure. Uh, Jorg writes, Dear Twivers, no listener question, just a comment on your recent episode. Thanks so much for debunking again, and unfortunately not for the last time, the hydroxychloroquine BS. Yet again, there was a positive remark. I like the condit bon mots. I started a collection. This is not going away anytime soon. We are still dealing with vitamin C. <laughs> Good quote, Rich. Correct, but vitamin C does not harm as hydroxychloroquine does. Let the people who have their dose of vitamin C, there is plenty of proof of placebo effect. Great if this comes without side effects other than spending a buck or two. Didn't want to interrupt your brilliant podcast, so would you please go on? Best wishes, Jord. Okay, and uh, he's not the only one that likes favorite kind of sayings. I have a mail folder, and so I just pulled out one of them. Vacation message, November 16th, 2013. Quote, I am out of the office until November 28th and will have only very limited access to email, if any. I may occasionally reply to some messages, but don't count on it. I will clean up the mess during Thanksgiving break after I return. So, <laughs> do you remember that, Rich? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I usually don't leave a, a, a gone away message. That's pretty good. Yeah. So I'm, I'm permanently away now. Yeah. Okay. 2013. Rich. Woo. Yeah. Rich, Rich, you're next. Elise writes, Dear Twiv, thank you so much for my new favorite podcast. I'm a recent li listener and very grateful to have the podcast to turn to as an assurance that I am being told facts about things that I might misinterpret if found if I found them elsewhere. Furthermore, as a third year undergraduate biology major with a fascination for microbiology and virology. I love being able to l l look up to you all as role models. I am set to move into my on-campus apartment two weeks from today, August 16th, for a mixture of in-person and online classes. Last week, I completed the at-home testing kit required for my return. However, I think it's clear that my school, though they are asking us to self-isolate until we arrive, is sweeping under the rug the guarantee that students will be exposed uh, between the time they take the test and the time they step on campus. As far as I know, there are no procedures in place for regular asymptomatic testing upon our return. Knowing how important testing and surveillance is to assure that we won't have to pack up and leave as soon as we move in, and also that rapidly rapid daily testing tools exist that the school has resources to use, this is frustrating to me. How can I, as a lowly undergrad, communicate the importance of frequent testing to the administration at my school? And is there an avenue by which the school can acquire the rapid daily testing measures despite the fact that they are not yet FDA approved? I feel that without proper testing procedures, the school is taking a risk that is not outweighed by the benefits of being on campus, benefits which will be limited by the fact that many activities will be canceled. What can I do to show the school that frequent testing is a way towards striking a balance? Thank you for your advice. Sincerely, Elise. Wow, big problem. Um, you know, I'm, my first reaction, actually, we have a whole lot of links in this episode uh, uh, from other emails and stuff about uh, rapid testing and um, places where people are trying to deploy it. 
And all I can think of is sending those. And uh, I've circulated that MedCram video um, that uh, basically it's a, a, a nice quick summary of the MINA episode that talks about the relationship between sensitivity and uh basically screening power of uh, various tests. I've circulated that to a lot of people. And in fact, I'm about to see if I can engage the individuals at Texas State here uh, with a lot of this information because, well, to see if I can engage them. The only thing, the only thing I can recommend is sending some of this information to uh, who's ever, try and find out who's running the testing program uh, at your institution and enlighten them with some of this information. I'd start out with a MedCram thing and several other um, uh, other links and say, dudes, if you're not testing every other day, twice a week or whatever, and uh, that we're headed for trouble. You also might want to include the uh, paper that we had at the beginning about what happened at the camp. Yeah. Um, and I would probably say that um, thing, people who are involved with things like student life or sort of residential life at your campus, as well as uh, student health, uh, might be uh, people to talk with. The thing yeah. is that, you know, we talk about all these rapid tests and stuff, but uh, as we've uh, talked about already, there are only uh, a handful that are actually now FDA approved for uh, emergency use uh, authorization. And those are going to be have to, they are point of care. So you could probably do them at a health center or something like that. But it's not like there's, there's, you at this point, we, we are not, we don't have the capability to give everybody a paper strip spit test. Okay. That's people have that in mind, but it's not ready yet. However, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, a university health center or something like that could not institute some sort of rapid testing program. Right. So at the beginning of 648, that TWIV episode where uh, Daniel talked, he I scribbled down uh, some of these LAMP uh, emergency youth authorization tests, and I can't read my writing very well, so you're going to have to go back and listen to them. But the only one I can read is Sherlock um, and then some UCSF something or other, uh, dates of approval from May 18th all the way up through July 29th. So you could you could get those names and list them in your letter when you contact whoever you decide to contact. And another reminder is that uh, Vincent has been posting on the website uh, sample letter templates for you to, or anyone, to write to whoever the most appropriate entities are. If it's your Congress people, your university people, your city people, your employer, HR, or whatever. Uh, so check uh, out. I actually have a, I've been keeping a list of these tests. <clears throat> mm, good. Um, I don't, uh, I need to update it some, uh, but the, uh, I believe the, well, no, I shouldn't. Well, there's E25 Bio. That's the one that uh, uh, Mina suggested, but they are not commercial yet, and they're not approved yet. There's Sherlock Biosciences, which is a CRISPR test. I don't know about the approval status of that. There's Mammoth Biosciences, which is a CRISPR test. There's a Kydel test that's an, antigen, an immunofluorescence uh, antigen test, and that is FDA approved. Uh, for uh, emergency use. Likewise, a BD test that's an antigen test. Daniel keeps mentioning uh, AuraSure, and if you look up their company, they do manufacture strip tests for uh, influenza, but I don't see anything on their site about a test for SARS-CoV-2, so I don't know what the status of that is. And then, of course, there's the Abbott ID now. Okay, so uh, none of these are things, none of these are home tests. But there are several tests out there that are point of care and tests that can be done in 15 minutes or so uh, with uh, some, but not necessarily a lot of uh, equipment. Uh, so there, it would be possible to set those up on a college campus, it seems to me. Oh, there's there's no reason why you can't. It's just a matter of money. And if yeah. you're worried about that, worry about shutting down 
in your first week when people come back, you're going to have cases. There's no doubt about it. People coming from all over the country. There's no reason why colleges cannot institute this kind of testing uh, on their own. Um, and if they're not, you're going to have to be very vocal. You're going to have to have at the very top of your letter something that's going to catch their eye. Like, without frequent testing, we will have SARS-CoV-2 on our campus within the first week. Something. You have to do that, but you can't just write it and send it. You're going to have to be very active and get someone's attention. So work. it's going to take work. Yeah. University of Michigan's plan is something similar. We just got it yesterday or the day before. And when I read through it, I didn't quite get it because you're going to take a test and but then two weeks later you're going to show up on campus well the idea is that you're going to self-isolate and that everyone else is going to self-isolate and at least Brianne you said that there was they had planned to have staggered arrival yeah, we on originally campus. were going to do staggered move in and um they haven't talked about anything as intelligent as that here. So uh, you can just imagine the elevators being crowded and, you know, whatever goes with mute, move in. So. And wear face masks. I still see too many people without them. I don't get it. Come on. Kathy, do you have a pick for us? I do. <laughs> uh, now I have to zoom to the bottom where my picks are. Um, oh, yes. I, oftentimes will be awake at 4.50 a.m. just before uh, Morning Edition comes on NPR. And for us, that time is a BBC time slot of something called uh, Witness History. And uh, recently there was one that was about uh, Maurice Hilleman. So there's only nine minutes to this audio, but it's really good. We've talked about Maurice Hilleman a lot before on TWIV, and there's quotes in it from Paul Offit, who worked with Maurice Hilleman. So I think people should check that out. And then uh, today's astronomy picture of the day, which is another uh, uh, pick site that I come to a, a lot, is something called Picture Rock Sun Dagger. And it's just a cool short little video that you can look at also. All right. That's TWIF 650. Show notes, microbe.tv slash twiv. That's where you'll find all the letters and links to the things we talk about. Questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, you could support us financially, microbe.tv slash contribute. And um, the letters, the, all these letters that we're collecting, microbe.tv slash twiv slash testing dash letters. I could make a shorter thing, but I haven't done it yet. I have a lot of things I have to do. I have to make this T-shirt today. That's on, on my list. <laughs> I have other things to do. And then I forget because nobody to remind me except Kathy when I don't post the episodes on Twitter. She'll say, post it. Post well, and it. there's another T-shirt that you promised too yeah, was or that Daniel mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, what yeah. was that one? Oh, yes. The masks. masks. Oh, yeah. So I have Sharon Isern making that one. She's designing a masks. Uh Masks are cool with a TWIV logo on it, yeah. So I, sometimes I delegate, which is good. Yeah. I should do it, I should do it more often. <laughs> well, I do. You guys do the show with me. Uh, Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, uh, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. And Brianne Barker is at Drew University on Twitter. She is Bioprof Barker. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>